Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining this panel today. My name is Anjali Perrin, and I'm the Associate Director on the Project on War Crimes and Mass Graves at Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute. We're so excited to host this panel today on Human Rights Day, um, looking at the future of environmental justice. We have three amazing panelists to speak to you about their um, incredible work around the world. I'll introduce the panelists and they'll each speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, so first up, we have Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, who is co-director for the Center of Human Rights and Global Justice at New York University's School of Law. He's editor-in-chief of Open Global Rights. Cesar has published widely on global governance, international human rights, climate litigation, socio-environmental conflicts, and business and human rights. He has served as expert witness at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights as, and as an adjunct judge on the Constitutional Court of Columbia. He's also been a member of the science panel for the Amazon and lead litigator in climate change, socioeconomic rights, and indigenous rights cases. Um, peace builder, environmental activist, and pan-Africanist Landy Ninteretse studied communication and international development in Burundi and Uganda. Landry is also an active member of several regional and environmental networks. He has been working with 350.org since uh, 2009 to build and grow the regional climate movement. And in 2019, he helped launch Africa VUCA, a regional platform of over 100 civil society groups working to stop fossil fuels development and promoting alternative clean energy solutions across Africa. He currently serves as the 350.org Africa Regional Director. And finally, we have Hilary A. Doon, who is a climate law fellow at the Sabine Center for Climate Change Law, where she focuses on climate litigation and deregulation and expanding renewable energy resources. Hillary holds a JD from Yale Law School and previously served as a clerk to the Honorable Robert N. Chitigny of the U.S. District Court for the District of Connecticut and the Honorable Barbara A. Lenk of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. Um, I'll hand it over to Cesar to get us started. Thanks, Anjali, and thanks for uh, the invitation to this panel and to the other members of the panel. Uh, what I thought I would share with you all today is the results of, an, of a study I directed here at NYU uh, that uh, surveys the universe of uh, human rights-based cases on climate change that have been brought before domestic or international judicial or quasi-judicial bodies. Um, and that have been going on for around 15 years now. So I'll start with a quick overview of what those cases uh, look like. Then I'll go quickly into some of those cases. I won't have time to elaborate on any of them. And then finally, I'll leave you with a few lessons and challenges for human rights activism and for climate action that can be extracted from the analysis of this body of litigation and um, and in judicial rulings. So I'll share my screen now and walk you through the basics of what this universe looks like. So one striking finding from this study uh, is that uh, most of the litigation, 90% uh, of the litigation that's based on human rights um, has happened between 2005 and 2020. So this is a little graph that shows you at least the proportion, around 90%, 89% to be uh, precise, of the cases that have been brought to courts uh, and to international venues such as the UN Committee on Human Rights or more recently, the Committee of the Rights of the Child or even more recently, the European Court of Human Rights have taken place since 2015. And it's, uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with a climate change regulation, but that's the, the year of the, of course, of the Paris Agreement that we hopefully now uh, move forward more quickly when uh, the US rejoins it. So uh, I'll, I'll, I won't have time to attempt an explanation, but part of the uh, paper is a sociological and sociolegal understanding of why this happened, why this happened around 2015, and why is it that we're seeing a veritable kind of avalanche of cases uh, 
over the last five years, but even more clearly and intensely over the last year. You know, I've started this research project about a year ago, and uh, these days I'm finding myself having to uh, 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 to update the database almost on a weekly basis, which is a good thing. It makes for challenging research, uh, but uh, it makes for very interesting practice. Um, so in terms of where this is taking place, uh, most of the cases have taken place in Europe. Uh, you will have heard um, of uh, Urgenda case in, in the Netherlands. I'll show you a, a picture in a moment. But uh, the Urgenda case and others uh, that are similar to Urgenda had really spread throughout the region for the last five years. Urgenda was started in 2013, but the first lower court decision took place in 2015. And then, but then interestingly, and this is something that I've written about if anyone is interested, uh, uh, there's like a rising trend of uh, litigation taking place in the global south, Africa, uh, South Asia, um, uh, Latin America, and then interestingly also before regional and global judicial and quasi-judicial venues, all the way from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights to the UN Committee, uh, the UN Human Rights uh, Committee. Now, uh, these are some of the cases. Uh, uh, again, there are so many interesting cases. Uh, just uh, recently, for example, uh, four cases were filed before Brazilian courts that I would urge everyone to uh, follow um, uh, closely. If anyone, by the way, is interested in, in, a, in a broader sample of cases, we published a, a, a blog series in Open Global Rights um, with authors from these jurisdictions. Some of, this, some of these are lawyers who have litigated these cases. The, the blog series is called Litigating the Climate Emergency. So this is a picture from the well-known Urgenda case that basically uh, um, succeeded in getting the Dutch government to ramp up uh, its ambition in terms of carbon emissions uh, mitigation reduction uh, in line with at least the minimum level recommended by uh, uh, you know, scientists the, of the IPCC. Um, this is a case in Latin America in the Amazon region in Colombia um, that I had the opportunity to uh, work on with colleagues at the Justicia and the Justicia continues to um, uh, supervise and, and to monitor the implementation of this case on behalf of 25 young um, people who sued the Colombian government to uh, before the uh, uh, Supreme Court and got to um, have the court mandate that the government come through uh, with its promise to cut down deforestation in the Amazon region. Um, a very different but also very important case um, also from earlier this year was the suspension of plans to build a third runway at Heathrow Airport in London. And I'm, the reason why I'm singling out this particular case is that it was really supposedly or, and, and on, you know, uh, ostensibly um, decided on administrative technicality grounds. Um, but the submission by Plan B, a great NGO uh, filing some of these cases in the UK, it was squarely based on the fact that a third runway at Heathrow would take the UK well beyond the uh, point of zero net emissions in 2050 with the with the net outcome of violating all types of, of, of human rights, from the right to health, to the right to uh, a clean air, to uh, the right uh, to housing, and so on. And, and more, there's uh, clearly a more recent case uh, in Ireland, uh, Supreme Court uh, quashed the government's uh, climate action for being in violation of, of human rights. Although the, again, the decision was not based on human rights grounds, the, the, the submission was. And finally, and more recently, this is one of the cases in Brazil that I was mentioning on the Amazon region. And this is the presiding judge over this case, uh, Justice Barroso. We hear the uh, Climate Mitigation Accelerator and the Global Justice Clinic are submitting with Connectus Brazil uh, and Amicus on this case. And this is an effort to push, to pressure the Bolsonaro government to implement um, the climate and the Amazon fund uh, programs. These are monies that were set aside to fight deforestation and to um, uh, reduce environmental harm in the Amazon that the government, uh, Bolsonaro government has chosen uh, to not use, of course, with the disastrous consequences that everyone has seen around the world as we've been alarmingly followed the uh, 
in worsening firing seasons in the Brazilian Amazon. <clears throat> Quickly, this is a recent trend. Of course, most cases have not yet um, reached the stage of, of, uh, of trial or even judicial decisions. So most of them are either on appeal or pending. But in terms of the breakdown of favorable or unfavorable decision, it's pretty even. So one thing that, I, uh, that and this is already a segue into the last bit of my presentation, um, even though these are relatively recent and bold uh, um, lawsuits, courts are not, um, in most countries, the US is definitely exceptional in, in this regard, um, for reasons that probably Hillary will speak to. Um, but most, in most countries, courts are very willing to take these cases, whether or not, they're not they're, they will rule for the plaintiffs a different matter. But even on the substantive ruling, the, the breakdown so far is even. So, and I would predict, and this is also a finding from uh, my research and practice, that as the climate emergency gets more dire, courts are already showing more willingness to step in. And, and do something about uh, the threats of, uh, of climate change um, around the world. Uh, finally, I'll, I won't have time to elaborate on any of these norms or many of these doctrines that are emerging from this body of, of um, uh, jurisprudence, but I'll at least um, sketch them for you and I'd be happy to take questions in the Q&A if there's interest. So what is it that we're seeing emerge from this case? One is the slow, um, emergence of, uh, of their formal recognition of a right to a livable, stable climate system. Uh, that's clearest, for example, in the case of the Inter-American Courts Advisory Opinion from 2017, which squarely says that um, defending and recognizing, acknowledging and protecting uh, a right to a healthy environment includes the protection of the conditions of the biosphere that uh, allow uh, human beings to live in a, in a, in a um, tolerable climate system. And then, importantly, most courts have said that they do have the power and, and the competence to review targets and policies, governments, targets, and policies. So even when courts have ruled against the plaintiffs, for example, in a well-known case in, in Germany, uh, the courts have asserted their competence uh, uh, and their role in not leaving complete discretion to governments in setting, for example, the level of ambition with regards to uh, how fast or, or how much to decarbonize the economy. Um, importantly, the practical role from a sociological point of view, sociopolitical point of view, what many of these cases are doing is providing a conveyor belt, some sort of conduit to translate international science coming mostly from the recommendations of the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, into local action. In the face of the breakdown of real progress in Paris or after Paris, uh, this role is crucial because it's been mostly courts that have been um, ready and uh, willing to um, bring down to the domestic level those lofty promises that were made in, in Paris and keep government policies up to speed with the recommendations of science. Uh, and finally, there's a, uh, a complex but important uh, moral and legal debate on exactly what it is that each country needs to contribute, um, given that, of course, um, a livable climate system is a, is a public good, uh, it, it needs to be, um, uh, everyone needs to contribute to it if we are to um, uh, enjoy it as a, as a, as a global um, public good. Um, I, I'll just leave it out, out there and finish just by saying that there are challenges and blind spots. One is uh, the always complex issue of causality. Uh, for example, there are a number of uh, litigants trying to pin down causality and responsibility for extreme weather events. Uh, for example, more recently, the hurricane season in the Caribbean. And, and uh, um, of course, there is attribution science that helps us uh, create the, or, or make an argument before courts that, yes, some of those uh, weather events have been made more likely by 
global warming, but that's still um, a heavy lift for litigants before uh, most of these courts. Um, finally, the what I see as the most interesting and fertile grounds for research and advocacy is uh, um, the development of doctrines, concepts, and 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 even procedural um, uh, techniques to incorporate into the human rights architecture the human uh, the rights of future generations. So human rights uh, are usually uh, backward looking. They're mostly about redressing past violations. In the case of climate change, we, will, we all know the most serious violations will take place in the future and will affect people, either people who are young um, uh, today or who have yet to be born. And there are a number of cases being litigated on, number, uh, on behalf of young people, but courts have a hard time um, um, adjudicating uh, some of these issues. And finally, I'll, uh, I'll just mention one thing that I forgot, which is that 90% of these cases have, um, have been brought against states as opposed to um, uh, corporations. So corporate liability remains a relatively uh, unpopulated space for human rights based litigation. I think there's a lot of opportunity for interesting uh, um, litigation there. And as there is also space for litigation on adaptation, because again, the large majority of cases have to do with mitigation as opposed to adaptation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cesar, for that really fascinating uh, presentation, looking at both uh, where we've come, how climate change litigation is really evolving and increasing dramatically um, over the last 15 years, and also what some of the, you know, both opportunities as well as challenges and blind spots remain. I'll now turn it over to Landry to talk about some of his work um, focused mostly on Africa and working closely with grassroots organizations. Thank you very much. And uh, again, I'm very uh, grateful for being on this panel uh, this evening. So as you said, I'll be essentially presenting from an African perspective how um, um, climate change is impacting human rights and also looking at some uh, current um, strong case study uh, coming from Uganda. We're going to see how um, uh, fossil fuel projects are impacting lives of communities and the number of rights and uh, finish with some reflection on what can be done if we are to fight for inclusive and sustainable um, um, environmental justice. So I have a presentation that I'm going to share uh, right now. So going to, to this. Let me know if you can see right. All right, thank you. So um, as I will be introducing, as you know, um, Africa has contributed, I mean, has contributed the, the least to the, uh, in the rise of um, um, global emissions. However, that's a continent which is unfortunately the most affected and impacted by the impact, uh, climate impact. And we see this on, um, I would say, on a daily basis uh, from in different parts of, of the continent, north, south, east, west, uh, recurrent flooding and uh, um, drought and associated uh, disease and other unfortunate events that take, you know, claim the life of hundreds, if not thousands, almost on a continuous basis. And this uh, situation magnified the vulnerabilities where human rights are not protected. Uh, those with less capacity or less, uh, resources are also not able to anticipate and uh, respond uh, to such uh, uh, unfortunate climate related events. So the climate change also undermine the realization of international recognized human rights. So basically the very simple fundamental right for life, for food, to have um, an adequate shelter and to live in a, in a safe, um, um, uh, pollution-free condition. Those basic rights are at the moment uh, at risk for millions out there uh, on the continent. So that was just 
uh, a way of uh, introducing. And we're going to look at uh, some of the uh, key um, uh, kind of rights that are being at the moment affected using some of the recent statistics produced by Amnesty International uh, that last year in September uh, during the uh, the global mobilization, which had, um, uh, which was uh, led uh, by the um, uh, young climate strikers, uh, this uh, this is when this report was produced, and it shows that uh, at least four hundred thousand uh, premature death and an additional two hundred and fifty uh, uh, death also are expected between 2020, 2030, sorry, and twenty fifty. And also there is likely to be an increase in the uh, uh, global hunger and malnutrition rates uh, by 20% in the same period, uh, you know, by 20, uh, uh, 2050. Uh, as I said previously, the right to, to water, sanitation and health is also uh, affected. So 1 billion, 1 billion, which is approximately one person out of eight, uh, are going also to be in a severe uh, conditions. I mean, they're going to see uh, uh, the access to clean water, water resources um, are affected. 20% in sub-Saharan African countries and 62% in South Asia in, in the, that kind of uh, period that I mentioned. And the, another kind of basic right that I would like to mention here is the right to clean energy. Uh, as we speak, uh, five out of 10 people, uh, persons in Africa, still don't have uh, access to clean uh, energy, either for, for cooking or for um, uh, or housing, uh, you know, domestic consumption. And this uh, kind of statistic hasn't really evolved that much, and that still shows the gap. And this connects to the third point that I'm going to make here, which is the, um, the current proliferation or development of fossil fuels taking place on the continent, while um, I think the global trend is on phasing out, especially coal project. We've seen in the uh, recent years an increased kind of speed of um, um, uh, proposed coal plants in a number of areas. And that's where also there is a, a very um, active and aggressive resistance uh, to such a project from the communities, from the very right civil society, local groups and communities that are directly affected are resisting such projects. And as a result of that, they are also uh, facing increased threats as we are going to see that. Uh, sorry, next. Uh, yeah, um, uh, this is the, the, the situation that I was describing. At the moment, uh, 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 climate activists local leaders, indigenous communities and environmentalists that are, are facing threats, intimidation and uh, other forms of increased uh, repression as they try to protect the land, um, um, the water, our sources, and basically to protect their livelihood. Uh, again, uh, the statistic from uh, Amnesty International shows like um, uh, such environmental activists are uh, 3.5 more likely uh, to be killed uh, due to their activism and their opposition uh, to uh, such uh, um, fossil fuel projects. And the role of um, uh, the fossil fuel industry is very, um, um, you have to be stressed because we've seen uh, some of the, you know, the yeah, multinational or fossil fuel com uh, um, um, companies either involving oil, gas, or, 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 or call uh, working hand in hand with uh, corrupt politicians uh, across Africa, across Asia, Latin America, and in some parts of also Asia uh, to do it, uh, to make sure to silent, basically, to silent local activists that are trying to, to resist the implementation of such project. And this has resulted in very severe losses and disturbing uh, human rights violation uh, especially in those three uh, big, big uh, uh, continents that I mentioned. And the, 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 the same statistic shows that the, um, the fossil fuel industry was directly responsible for more than 45,000 deaths caused by health issues and the displacement of thousands, 60,000 people 
and the dump of 18 million gallons of toxic wastes water into rivers. I think this is just some of the examples that are going to illustrate with um, a specific case study of, uh, um, of Uganda. Sorry, I think that's the, uh, that's the case I want to mention. So um, uh, Total, which is this French uh, multinational oil company that you all know, is currently involved in two massive uh, projects in East Africa, uh, mainly Uganda and Tanzania. So the, the aim is to extract uh, approximately 200,000 barrel of oil on a daily basis, and also to transport uh, such um, a huge um, you know, quantity of oil from the Western part of Uganda uh, to the um, uh, Indian coasts uh, in, in, in Tanzania. And which would be one of them, uh, you know, they're also constructing that um, huge pipeline, uh, which is going to be likely to be the longest heated crude oil pipeline in the world. And by doing so, um, the, 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 the company, and of course, with the, uh, the government of Tanzania and, and Uganda, are likely to displace tens of hundreds of people in both countries. And over the last, since the, the oil discovery in 26, there have been uh, a number of human rights violations have been recorded uh, since the very beginning from the, um, uh, the initial procedure of uh, uh, going to community to raise the awareness of the project or to explain and to, um, to be kind of the, the, the project as it is, it looks like it, it, it has been imposed on the population without free consent or free will because uh, when you analyze the entire uh, process of uh, uh, even producing the EIA's environmental impact assessment uh, to the situation where the, um, uh, the case is, uh, we have been um, uh, able to identify a number of uh, uh, violations that includes the, 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 the violation to the right of property. As, as I said, you know, um, many have been um, displaced and not properly compensated. We've seen a, a sharp deterioration in the living conditions and the livelihood of the communities. Some of them are farmers and they are no longer able to do so. Hence, uh, you know, having their uh, livelihood affected. Others are, um, are fishermen. They survive on, on being able to go out in the lakes um, about and, and uh, Lake about Victoria and Edward there. At the moment, such um, kind of um, activities uh, for um, um, families are disturbed. And also um, very um, uh, concerning uh, whoever, whoever try to raise the, the, the voices or to, to oppose or to challenge is likely to be either uh, harassed, arrested or killed. So there have been uh, a number of cases where um, either local activists, lawyers, journalists, whoever is trying to document and to expose uh, these challenges is in trouble. And if you've been following also the situation uh, of Uganda, which is, um, which will be going soon on uh, um, on poll. They are having presidential elections in, um, I think, yeah, ne next month in January. Even the, the some of the presidential candidates are going through such, you know, incredible harassment from security force, you know, uh, um, security forces. So that's if even sometimes the president, if the presidential candidates can be threatened to that level, you can imagine what can happen to simple. Or activists on the ground or environmental um, 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 organization that are trying uh, to protect uh, their land and their livelihood. So uh, the threats are uh, kind of uh, are rampant. Uh, cases are many. Uh, even as of last week, one of our local partners have seen his office attacked for the third time in uh, three months. So basically, his his house or his office has been visited on a monthly basis by strangers uh, uh, who have kind of um, uh, tried to steal uh, the information and uh, the computers and other equipment because he's known as being one of the uh, um, you know one of the vocal uh, uh, person against the project. Um, uh, this is the last slide which looks at you know what can be done on how the future of environmental justice looks like from you know uh, a human right and also uh, a continental perspective. We say that the strong uh, protection of human right is a par is a paramount if we are to build resilient societies. And I think 
it could be um, um, a topic to be fighting for uh, climate justice if we don't fight for human rights. I think these are climate uh, change rights and human rights are um, intimately um, linked. So you can't fight for another without fighting the, the, the doors because first of all, we, have, we need um, our, our brothers and sisters and our, um, um, the civil society to be able to operate. Uh, we need uh, um, um, space. Um, open space for uh, activists to be able to raise their concern, to be able to express uh, and to enjoy the freedom of expression and association uh, so they can actually raise their, uh, their alarm on what's happening on the ground. And uh, as a continent also which has contributed the least to the global um, uh, temperature, uh, I think Africa needs to develop uh, in a way which is sustainable. That means not allowing uh, fossil fuels to be project at the moment to be installed and um, uh, to be uh, to start because we may find ourselves locked in an, in a situation where uh, for the next uh, 50 or 100 years we find ourselves locked in a situation where we became dependent and addicted to coal which goes against let's say the agreement the Paris uh, agreement we, uh, uh, which has been uh, ratified by a number of African nations. And also the, um, there is a responsibility, as I said, of international or energy companies uh, and, and, and financial or partners of Africa uh, to really prioritize um, uh, renewables and sustainable sources of energy and not uh, fossil fuels. And also there is a responsibility of the government, uh, African government, uh, also in Africa, but also in other in low income countries need to be more assertive and vigilant and be able to push back um, uh, whatever doesn't, whatever project or proposal doesn't meet uh, the needs of the locals and um, uh, reject the cheap energy project because at the moment uh, coal and sometimes even fracking in um, Namibia and Botswana currently as you speak are proposed as the cheapest source of, of energy, but uh, uh, without necessarily looking at the you know, uh, current and potential impact of such projects for uh, the current and future generations. And that's why we say government have to be um, uh, vigilant, have to be uh, observant and be able to also listen uh, to the voice of the, the locals, the civil society and scientific uh, scientists that have been raising arm for four years from now. And uh, I will stop there and be able to take questions at the later stage. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Landry, for that really fantastic presentation, both highlighting um, the global challenges that we face with climate change, um, specifically how it affects the African country, um, the African continent, and then also thinking about the role of environmental defenders and the specific risks that they face um, for those who are at the front line of challenging some of these harms and violations. And finally, what Africa as a continent needs to do to ensure a more sustainable future and sustainable development that doesn't replicate some of the mistakes made in other continents. Finally, um, I will turn to Hillary now to wrap us up before we get to questions. Thank you very much and I'm really grateful to be um, appearing with such distinguished panelists. I'll just um, talk a little bit about a few of the cases in the Saban Center's database of climate change litigation to e expand a little bit on what we've already heard and then bring it closer to home by discussing environmental justice in the context of the United States and, and also specifically in New York. Um, as, as we heard, rights-based climate litigation is really burgeoning around the world and in many instances, even when courts have not fashioned the relief that plaintiffs seek, they have um, acknowledged that climate change. I want to discuss um, two proceedings in particular that are related to the issue of climate-induced displacement because there is no um, international framework for addressing climate migration. And so these types of, of, of petitions are um, at the forefront of what of, of one of the issues that we're seeing within the context of climate rights. One is um, a petition that uh, was brought before the UN Human Rights Committee. And as background, the petitioner um, was a resident of the, the small island nation of Kiribati. 
um, which is of course threatened by climate impacts and specifically sea level rise. He moved to New Zealand and sought um, refugee status on the ground that deporting him would violate his right to life under New Zealand law. I uh, filed a petition with the UN Human Rights Committee um, arguing that New Zealand had The committee concluded that New Zealand had not acted home uh, because he had not um, offered sufficient evidence that his right to life was an imminent danger. Um, significantly, the committee did uh, conclude that it, without um, ambitious national and international action on climate change, the impacts could become so severe that the right to life would be threatened and could even reach the point where countries receiving climate migrants cannot send them home without violating international rights. And so this is an important um, step forward or moving the ball forward on, on recognizing the urgent need to address climate change and, and what, what the international rights framework may require of countries in the future. Um, another petition that I'll mention and in part to, to bring this to the United States context is a, a petition filed by five Indian tribes in the United States um, to a number of UN special rapporteurs alleging that the United States government by failing to address the roots of climate change that have caused or could cause a displacement of those tribes uh, has violated their international rights um, and or international human rights or human rights recognized under international law. And the petition asks these special rapporteurs to make recommendations to the US government, including recognizing the inherent sovereignty of the tribes and also granting federal recognition to at least one of the tribes that is not currently federally recognized. And so this is an interesting example of um, people in the United States seeking to use international law to vindicate rights that in their view they have, but that have not been recognized within the US system. Uh, but in the context of the United States, um, typically when we discuss environmental justice, it's not in a human rights framework. Um, it's, it's within the context of the right to not be discriminated against on the basis of membership in a, in a racial group or a, or a member of an economic class. And so, so the EPA defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And it is um, beyond dispute that the impact of both greenhouse gas pollution and, and other types of environmental pollution fall disproportionately on communities of color and low-income communities in the United States in the context of climate change. Um, a report just came out yesterday actually uh, affirming that low-income communities and communities of color are more likely to live in hotter areas of cities and um, extreme heat is the deadliest uh, form of, of climate impact. Um, and so this, is, this presents a, a real um, environmental injustice um, and, and significant um, crisis as, as we will see. Um, we also know that heat can exacerbate um, air pollution. And so that is a, a, another way in which climate change is just compounding um, the disparate impacts of environmental pollution that we've seen in this country. It's also important to note that um, in addition to the climate change um, impacts to which um, communities of color and low-income communities tend to be more vulnerable. Um, we've seen that, that co-pollutants also fall disproportionately on these communities. And what I mean by that is that the sources of greenhouse gas emissions, like power plants and, and cars, um, also emit um, other pollutants that cause even more immediate health impacts, um, like soot um, or, the, um, or nitrous oxide, which can create smog. Um, and, and these are pollutants that can um, cause or exacerbate um, respiratory illness um, and, and asthma and so on. And so um, I, I want to note that um, what we've seen during this COVID crisis um, in particular is that communities of color in the United States, again, are, are the hardest hit. And that's undoubtedly because of a number of factors, but it appears that one is that it, um, 
underlying respiratory illnesses are, are often more common in these communities that tend to be cited near sources of, of pollution. And so the pandemic has, has really laid bearing compounded those, um, those disparities. Um, New York State is, uh, has started to attempt to address some of these disparities through new legislation that came into effect this year. The Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act sets ambitious mandates for the state to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions um, and also scale up renewable energy capacity. And it also seeks to protect and further the interests of what the act calls disadvantaged communities. And disadvantaged communities are defined as communities that have historically been overburdened by pollution or that are more vulnerable to climate change or that have members uh, who are lo of lower moderate income or historically have been discriminated against on the basis of race. Uh, and so the, the new law sets up a working group that's tasked with identifying criteria that will be used um, to identify these disadvantaged communities. That is a, a process that's ongoing now, it will take some time, but the law contains um, two, two provisions in particular that, that seek to protect these communities. One is a prohibition on state decisions like the decision to grant a permit that would disproportionately impact communities or disadvantaged communities. Um, and the other is a requirement that at least 35% of the benefits of the state's investments in clean energy and energy efficiency accrue to disadvantaged communities. And the act sets a goal that 40% of those benefits will go to those communities. So this, um, these are of course very important steps forward. It remains to be seen how exactly this will play out. And, and for example, the act doesn't specify that 35% of the dollars spent on clean energy and efficiency accrue to disadvantaged communities, but rather that 35% of the benefits, 35% uh, of the benefits do. And so one, one question we'll have to um, see is what does that mean and how is that implemented? So I'll end by just noting that the, um, the Biden campaign and transition has put environmental justice um, at the forefront of its platform and has picked up on this 40% um, goal as a target of the amount of benefits of investment in the clean energy revolution that should go to disadvantaged communities. And, and that too, of course, will be interesting to and, and important to watch and see how that unfolds. So I thank you very much for inviting me and, and look forward to hearing the questions. Thank you so much, Hilary, for especially focusing on some of the efforts that are happening um, in the United States, as well as how aspects related to litigation complaints, uh, both at the UN level, at the local city level, um, and other initiatives are working. Um, I guess a first question I have for all of you, and I see that there's a rather large number of questions in the Q&A, and I'll try to get through as many as we can before the end of the session, is what are two priorities that you see as um, absolutely um, crucial that human rights advocates focus on based on the work that you have all been doing and some of the learning that you have gained? Uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Landry, then Hilary, then Cesar. Uh, I think one of the um, top priority is the, the protection of environmental activists and uh, those who are the um, are forefront, uh, are the front line uh, defending and protecting Mother Earth. So uh, the protection ensuring that they are able to gather, meet and express uh, their voice is, uh, will be uh, the first priority. The second one is the uh, connecting the human right movement and the climate uh, movement. I think there is at the moment some um, I said connections are already happening, but I think as we move forward, there will be increased collaboration uh, to happen because as we, we've seen uh, the two kind of crises or struggles are interlinked. I would add to that that one in with regards to litigation, one aspect to focus on is once um, a court reaches the judgment and orders the government to take action, what is them to, um, to follow up on 
And um, I would say that an, another um, important theme that's already been discussed, but that I'll, I'll just pick up on is the idea of, of current younger and future generations and um, protecting their, their right to life. And I, I, and I think we've seen that youth as the face of the climate movement um, is, is, is really compelling and sort of brings in the moral imperative that, that we're facing to address this crisis. And I, and I think we'll see more of that. I think that there are so many pending tasks that literally this is a relatively recent um, field. So those of you who might be interested in joining in, there's plenty of work to do, but in terms of priorities, I would say one is to be very strategic about the type of, of targets that uh, get picked for um, for um, litigation. Uh, and I mean the types of targets by the by kind of, of organization or um, or uh, um, organization basically meaning states versus corporations. So I mentioned how most of the litigation has that's been based on uh, human rights is uh, targeted at corporate at, at states as opposed to corporations. There is space given that uh, over the last 10 years or so, the field of business and human rights has been rapidly developing for creative cross pollinization between business and human rights, climate action and human rights at large. Uh, and one, a pioneer case, of course, is the uh, inquiry of the Filipino Human Rights Commission against the 19 uh, largest uh, carbon um, uh, fossil fuel companies. Uh, and the Filipino Commission is about to release its report, uh, first of its kind, and I'm hoping and, and anticipating that it will lead to similar inquiries and hopefully also litigation um, on climate change against some corporations. And finally, in terms of ecosystems um, I, one one thing that uh, has not been done um, very systematically this is something that the uh, climate litigation accelerator here at NYU is trying to do is to look systemically at what science is telling us would be deal breakers for the climate uh, for the for the climate system meaning for example we know from calculations and simulations done last year that without the Amazon there is no chance for the planet to stay below 1.5, even 2 degrees in, uh, of global warming. Or if uh, oil is drilled in the Arctic, also, that is, those are particularly um, um, uh, harmful developments. So the fact that there are uh, now uh, cases in Brazil, which hold 64% of the Amazon, and also in Norway, uh, against Aldrin in the Arctic, I think those are developments in the right direction. Thanks, all. Um, I guess I'll ask the next question first at Landry and then anybody else who wishes to contribute can jump in. Um, how can we advocate for climate action, especially in countries that don't prioritize climate change issues? This is a question from someone based in, in Mombasa, Kenya. Yeah, I think uh, though some um, uh, some countries might not be prioritizing uh, climate issues, uh, we know that across across the continent there are a number of uh, uh, local grassroots civil society uh, uh, organizations that are active and engaged in in this battle. I think they are, are yet to be kind of united and consolidated into stronger national coalition. I think that's the way forward. So actually, their voices can become stronger and louder and they can make impactful action. So we've seen movement in Kenya like Decolonize. That's the movement which is behind uh, the fight against the proposed coal plant in Lamu. And that movement, for instance, has been, ex has been extremely uh, successful and in inspiring uh, you know, uh, outside uh, the, the Kenyan boundaries. So I think there are uh, a number of opportunities uh, and possibilities for uh, local groups to come together to join forces and become louder for impactful actions. And at 350, we help such a uh, uh, movement to grow by providing resources and connecting them. Thanks, Landry. Um, 
I have a question for, I'm actually not sure who's going to take this. I'm going to offer it up to Cesar and feel free to bounce it back to one of your colleagues. Um, climate change issues are directly impacting peace and security in some parts of the world, like for example, in the Sahel. How do we evaluate or elevate this aspect of peace and security in institutions like the Security Council and its uh, relationship with uh, climate change? Well, the impact of climate change on human rights, <laughs> there is no, to put it simply, there are no human rights that are not affected by climate change, right? So this is an all-encompassing total phenomenon, to put it in theoretical terms, in which that is already affecting, is, is not sadly, I think, of the future anymore, it is already affecting the rights, like Hillary said, of migrants around the world, and uh, the UN has calculated that up to a billion individuals would be forcefully displaced uh, by um, climate events by 2050. Uh, like, uh, and there is quality research, for instance, on the um, direct impact of, uh, for example, droughts, floods on uh, armed conflict uh, and on massive displacement. So for example, instability in Northern Africa in 2015 was related to uh, droughts in the region. So I would, Think I would agree that going to venues that are less conventional in terms of issue areas, right? So Security Council, or to argue um, human rights cases uh, based on rights that are not usually directly invoked in most climate litigation. Most climate litigation um, are about um, right, uh, the right to health, uh, the right to life, the right to physical integrity, the right to housing, and they are directly and obviously impacted by climate change and dislocations associated with climate change. But uh, I think a, a very good case can be made about other types of human rights impacts, including, um, well, the, the ravages of war. Thanks, Cesar. Um, Hillary, a question for you. How has, you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but how has the pandemic impacted climate rights issues and how do you feel it will impact the way politicians navigate them maybe perhaps looking ahead to the the current change in administration in the us what do you foresee as the next steps in the future in balancing both the, the pandemic and thinking about climate rights well in addition to the fact that the pandemic has has exacerbated the um environmental disparities that I discussed earlier, I'll say that I, I think the Biden administration will see climate, uh, tackling climate change and particularly investments in renewable energy as an economic opportunity to get the US economy back on its feet. And so um, I, I think we hopefully will see huge investments in wind and solar energy that can transition us away from reliance on, on fossil fuels. And, and hopefully the, the benefits of those in, investments will also go to the community by climate change, as well as the conventional pollutants that are emitted by power plants and, and other unsustainable forms of energy that we've been living with. Thanks, Hillary. Um, a question maybe for both Cesar and Hillary. What do you think of the limitations of litigation as a strategy to countering climate change? And, um, you know, you've spoken a little bit about some of the opportunities, but what are the downsides of a sort of legalistic tool to tackle some of these issues? Do I have a first, Hillary? Oh, sure. Well, so I'll, I'll say, um, and Cesar touched on this, international or around the world, there have been um, some cases in which courts have recognized that, that climate change can threaten human rights, um, but essentially said the national government is not violating human rights because it's acting within its, appropriately within its um, policymaking discretion to address the issues. So say they're alluded to a case in Germany along those lines. And so I think that is, I, I, litigation um, is, can shine a spotlight on these 
these impacts and the fact that they uh, threaten human rights and that's extremely important. But at the end of the day, um, sometimes there are issues that need to be taken up by the by the legislature and the policy making branches. I'll mention also in the United States, we've seen some limitation on this type of rights based um, litigation approach with respect to climate change. Um, and specifically in a case called Juliana that was brought by a number of, of youth plaintiffs against the United States government alleging that there, there exists a constitutional right to a stable climate and that the government is violating that right by failing to adequately act on climate change. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals recently rejected this claim and, and found in no uncertain terms that climate change poses real threats and, and use terms like apocalyptic to discuss what we're facing, but said that the plaintiffs didn't have standing, which for the non-lawyers in the audience means the right to bring the case because the court could not fashion a remedy that would protect the right that the plaintiffs were asserting. And, and specifically that designing the type of climate policy that the plaintiffs really wanted require the types of policy making decisions that only Congress and the president can make. So that's that's a case that's specific to the to the U.S. legal system, um, but again, demonstrates how important it is for our political branches to take up this issue. <clears throat> so climate change is a unique problem in many ways. So it's, it's been called a super wicked problem because it, it, it really is the sum total of a number of problems, right? And one thing that and two things that characterize super wicked problems like climate change is their scale and the speed. And so we, in, and I'll refer to speed first, because I think that that's where litigation can be most helpful as opposed to scale. So speed means that delays are costly. It's not the same to start doing something about climate change in 2025 than in 2021. Uh, just as it is much more costly and difficult to do something about climate change today than it would have been 30 years ago when uh, the first evidence, public evidence of, 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 the, of the seriousness of climate change came into the open. So um, I'm hopeful for uh, climate change to serve as an accelerator, uh, sorry, for litigation to be an accelerator for climate action by prodding and nudging very effectively and hopefully urgently governments into action. Right? Now, the issue of scale is a different story because, of course, you, we're not going to we're going to solve a, a planetary problem um, case by case. So, what needs to happen, hopefully, is that there would be some sort of, uh, and we can see evidence of some of this happening already in some in some countries, some uh, virtual circle between. Um, pressure from litigation and importantly from social movements. One of the key and most hopeful developments is the fact that many of these cases are being brought to court by movements. Uh, so, uh, you know, Extinction Rebellion, Plan B, uh, Greenpeace, uh, 350 are all interested in one way or another in litigation and that, uh, you know, in increases the chance that this will get us where we need to be, but definitely in the end, it's about the structural uh, measures having to do with policy, with legislation that should be prompted by um, some of these lawsuits. Thank you. Um, I see that we're just about coming at time. And so uh, in conclusion, I'd just like to thank our three panelists so much for sharing so many rich examples and insights in their expertise with us. It's been a real pleasure to have you um, on behalf of the Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute. And we very much hope that we can continue these conversations. A recording of the event will be available on YouTube and um, we have many future events on this and similar issues. Uh, and so please sign up for our newsletter and um, thanks again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.